In this video, I'm going to go through a whole month of A-level physics teaching in about 80 minutes. I'm going to be using some questions from this book here. This is the Daily Workout Book 4, and this is questions that go through July, August, September, and October. So basically, uh, if you want to have a look at the questions, you can download those from the link just beneath the video, and then you'll get sent an email with all of the questions in. But of course, if you want to have the questions from the entire book, and actually something to write in, then you can buy this book on Amazon. Of course, I make videos about physics, and if you want to find videos where I explain all of the answers, and also there's a downloadable work solutions that you can get your hands on. If you want to find all of that, you can find those on my website, which is alevelphysicsonline.com. So uh, let's have a look at some physics. So welcome to September, and for many of you, the start of year 13. Uh, that's if you're doing the book in date order. On the 1st of September, this is the same question that we had a couple of months ago at the very start of uh, book four of the daily workout. And at the time when you first did this, a lot of these numbers or uh, quantities or units might have been a bit unfamiliar. Hopefully some of these are becoming a bit more familiar to you and you might understand uh, what some of the quantities actually mean and the definitions. So although it's the same question, have you improved your ability at physics? Can you remember more than you could before? And will you be able to remember these again towards the end of October? Okay, on the second, uh, the first one is just writing down the values and units for some common numbers. Now these are gonna come up all of the time. You don't have to remember them all off, uh, off by heart because a lot of these are given to you in your data and formula book. Uh, but big G, the gravitational constant, is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And uh, as you get used to these numbers, it means it's gonna really speed up your approach to problems. So uh, gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth is 9.81 newtons per kilogram. And the mass of the Earth is about 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Now for the answers where there's a bit more writing, I do have um, explanations or definitions in the back of the book. So if I look on the 2nd of September, um, you can see here that uh, there's a bit more of the kind of written answer. And really for the second part here, if something is accelerating, its velocity is changing, but velocity isn't just how quickly something is moving, it's also dependent on the direction. Now if you had something that was going at a constant speed, but was changing direction the whole time, then it would be accelerating. And a really good example of that that comes up all the time is circular motion. So that's something going at a constant speed, so traveling the same distance every second, but it's constantly changing its velocity because the direction is constantly changing and therefore it's accelerating and therefore it requires a force. Um, so circular motion is a great example of that. Uh, for the next one, we've got some definitions of what we mean by a field, because we're going to be looking at fields. And in September and October, I'm introducing a lot more of the Year 13 content that you might have started at the end of Year 12, you might be doing later in Year 13, or you might be doing at school at the moment. And really, I've tried to sort of draw um, magnetic, gravitational and electric fields together, because these are regions where certain things experience a force as outlined in the back of the book. Again, on the third, uh, the value for the gravitational constant, same as yesterday, but hopefully you can remember it now. We've got the permittivity of free space, uh, which is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, and that's farads per meter. And then, you know, from year 12, the elementary charge is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So again, uh, a lot of these you can look up, but I think a lot of these numbers you should just know off by heart, it will speed up everything else. Okay, the next one, uh, we've got the force that provides the centripetal force responsible for circular motion. With the Earth orbiting the Sun, it's a gravitational attraction between the two things. Uh, if you've got a rubber bung being swung round on a string, uh, this is a practical you might have a go at where you can actually try and measure the size of that centripetal force. It's due to the tension inside the string. And a motorbike going around a roundabout, um, the thing that's actually going to, sorry, that's not a motorbike, is it? That's a bike. Um, if you've got a motorbike going round a roundabout, it's the friction between the tyres and the road that causes that centripetal force acting inwards. The next one has uh, the gravitational field around an object. Now for this, the key points are, is that when you've got these uh, field lines which are straight, use your ruler, make sure you put an arrow on them, and also make sure that the lines are normal to the surface. 
So that means the line is at 90 degrees to that surface. And also there are eight lines in total. And effectively, uh, when the lines are closer together, that's where we have a stronger field. And as the lines get further apart, that tells us that the field isn't as strong. Now, of course, we normally measure angles in degrees, but we also tend to use radians, especially going into year 13. And in one full circle, which is 360 degrees, there are two pi radians. And I've just used rad, R-A-D, to signal that that is an angle in radians. Um, 180 degrees is going to be half of that, so it's pi radians. 90 degrees is half of that, so it's pi over 2 radians. And then 30 degrees is a sixth of 180, so that's pi over 6 radians. And that's given in its exact form. We then have some more forces. Um, at the centre of the, our galaxy, of the Milky Way, there's actually uh, a black hole called uh, Sagittarius um, A star. Uh, and so this is actually uh, the kind of supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy. And everything is spiralling, or not spiralling, everything is orbiting around that. And therefore it's going to be the gravitational force that causes the sun to orbit that black hole. If you have a cyclist riding anti-clockwise on the slope banks of the velodrome, um, so here's our cyclist, and they're going to be going, I suppose, anti-clockwise. Um, if we think about that slope, so maybe that's the sloped bank of the velodrome, um, then there's going to be a weight acting down from that cyclist, and there's going to be a normal contact force uh, between the cyclist and the surface. And effectively, there's going to be a horizontal component or resultant force acting inwards, and that provides the centripetal force. And of course, depending how quickly they're going, there might be friction either acting up or down the slope. So there might also be a horizontal component of friction, depending on qu how quickly they're actually going around those banks. Now for the next one, we have um, the horizontal component of lift from the wings. Now, I realized when I was making this video, I don't have a Supermoon Spitfire, but instead I've got uh, one of these aircraft instead. And as that's going to be going around a corner, it kind of uh, banks over to one side. Again, there's going to be the weight acting down. There's going to be the lift force, which is normal to the, to the wings. And it's going to be a horizontal component of that lift force, which is acting towards the center of the circle. So um, these things here, provide what we call the centripetal force, which allows these objects to move in a circular path. We then had a question uh, looking at the gravitational field lines. Uh, and so we've got our Lego figure, Lego figure here uh, at uh, ground level. Um, and here, effectively at ground level, what we experience in everyday life appears to be a uniform gravitational field. It doesn't matter if we go left and right or up and down, the strength of gravity feels the same. And therefore, at the surface of the Earth, we have equally spaced lines. All of them are going to be normal to the surface, so at 90 degrees. And that's because we have this uniform field um, in the kind of local area where we are. It's only if you zoom out that we then see that, see that these field lines would eventually start to kind of maybe uh, part away from each other, because each of these individual field lines would be pointing towards the center of the Earth. Hopefully that makes sense. On the fifth, uh, again, there's some more um, converting between radians and degrees. Um, now, a way that you can do this is multiply by 180 and then divide by pi. So one radian times 180 divided by pi is equal to 57.3 degrees. And I think that this is an important number to be aware of. And also it means that if you can imagine what 57.3 degrees looks like, um, you know, that's maybe, um, you know, if you think about what that uh, relates to in terms of the circle, um, that's just a really important number to remember. Of course, 2 pi radians is going to be equal to 360 degrees, as we can see here, because 2 pi times 180 would be 360 pi, divided by pi is 360. Then we've got pi over 2 and pi over 3, uh, which are... 90 and 60 respectively. Now the next one, uh, we want to write an expression for the length of an arc L subtended by an angle theta given in degrees. Now effectively, um, here we were converting from radians to degrees. 
Here we kind of need to almost convert from degrees to radians, which is why we multiply by pi and divide by 180. So L is equal to R theta times pi over 180. And this would then give you the length. But if you wanted to write an expression for the length of an arc L, so tended by an angle theta given in radians, then L is equal to R theta, because effectively we don't really need this kind of conversion from degrees into radians. So L equals R theta, or indeed we could say that theta is equal to L divided by R. And that's why if the length of that arc is exactly equal to the radius, then L and R are going to be the same, and therefore that means the angle theta would be equal to 1. And so that's why one radian is defined as the angle when the arc length is equal to the radius of that circle. We then have a question about Newton's law of gravitation. Uh, so he's not just done his first three laws, he's done this one as well. And it basically states that the force is going to be proportional um, to the masses or the the, the multiple of the masses divided by the distance between them squared. And again, the full definition is in the back of the book. Um, and then we can write it as an expression where f equals g m1 m2 over r squared. Or you might write it as f equals minus g m m over r squared. Different exam boards express this in different ways. I feel personally you should have a negative sign in there that shows that it's always an attractive force. Now you might use m1 and m2 or small m and large m, just to distinguish between the two masses. Um, and we always use r to be the distance between the center of those masses. Now for the next one, to calculate the size of the gravitational force of attraction, it's going to be equal to the gravitational constant, big G, times the different masses. And we've got here the mass of the Earth that we looked at in another question a couple of days ago. We've got the mass of the person, 88.5 kilograms. And then we're going to divide by the distance between them squared. And so that's the radius of the Earth. And this gives us a value of 868 newtons. So that's the size of the force between these two things. Now the weight of the person, just using the equation W equals mg, uh, where g is the gravitational field strength at that point, is just 88.5 times 9.81, which is 868, which as you can see, is the same answer. So the gravitational force of attraction is the same or is equal to the weight of that person on the Earth. We begin on the 6th just with some conversion between degrees and radians. You should remember uh, from uh, yesterday's question that 57.3 degrees is exactly 1.00 radians. Uh, but each time we're just going to multiply by pi, divide by 180, and it gives these numbers down here. For the second part, we need to calculate the speed of an object that travels in a circle. We know the radius, we know the angle that it goes through over a certain amount of time. Now, speed is equal to distance divided by time, and the distance it travels along the, uh, around that circle is going to be equal to r theta. And that's what we worked out yesterday, this, this kind of little formula here. So if we know the radius of that circle and the angle that something has gone through in a certain amount of time, we can work out how quickly something is moving, its linear speed. So we know the radius times by the angle of 2.9 radians divided by 10 seconds gives us an answer of 0.812. So it's traveling at 0.81 meters per second. That one might have been a little bit tricky if you haven't covered this in school yet, but I think some of it kind of builds upon previous questions we've done. We then have an equation given to you uh, about the size of the gravitational field strength at a point, and it's given by g equals gm over r squared. Uh, so g is a gravitational field strength, we've got the gravitational constant, we've got the mass of something, and r squared is the distance. So here, the gravitational field strength on the Earth is big G times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared, and I've made sure, made sure I've converted this into metres, and that equals 9.81 newtons per kilogram, which is kind of what we know. Um, that is uh, 9.81, you'll have seen that number again and again and again. If we were to do the same on the moon, big G is going to be the same, but now we've got a much smaller mass and a smaller radius, and that means the value of the gravitational field strength is going to be much smaller. In actual fact, it's 1.62 
newtons per kilogram. And then we want to look at the ratio of the gravitational field strengths on the Moon to the Earth. So it's this value divided by this value, which equals 0 0.165. And there are often questions all the time in real exam papers where you're looking at the ratio between two numbers. Now on the 7th of September, there's a practical experiment, um, and it's just really a case of looking at what it says here, trying to imagine this. So this is like a top-down view on this turntable. Um, and we've got different masses, which are a different distance from the center of rotation, and there'd be a dial that you could use to adjust the speed. So there's a lot of information here. Um, the first thing, though, is we're going to be looking at the data in this table, and the first thing is to calculate the time period for one rotation. Now, you wouldn't just record the time for one rotation, if, uh, and it might be the same if you're looking at maybe oscillations of a pendulum or a spring going up and down. You'd maybe time the time for 10. So the first step is just taking this number, and all we're doing is we're dividing by 10 to get these numbers here. And I've kept those to three significant figures because that data is to three significant figures as well. We then have an equation uh, saying that the instantaneous linear velocity can be calculated by using the equation V equals 2 pi R over T, where T, capital T, is the time period for one rotation, as we see up here. So, um, if we know um, the time period and we know the radius, we can use that to calculate the speed at that point. So it's just 2 times pi times this number divided by that number, and it gives us these values for the instantaneous speed at that point, or velocity. We, we kind of tend to use the word velocity and speed uh, kind of interchangeably when it comes to, um, to, uh, to circular motion, just to confuse things. We then have the values of velocity squared. So all we've done is we've taken this number and we squared it, and it gives us this number over here, uh, as we've got in the table there. And then the next thing for part D is to plot a graph of V squared against R. Now for this one, um, I already had the axes labelled, so you can pot, plot your three points. Um, effectively, when R is zero, then uh, the velocity is going to be zero. So that's why it goes through the origin. And uh, we can use this then to describe the relationship between V squared and R. And the two things are directly proportional. If you double R, that doubles your value of v squared. So there's this linear, directly proportional relationship. Now it says here that the size of the centripetal force, F, is equal to mv squared over r. So why does the mass start to slide off the turntable as it gets faster? Well, basically, if we can look at this, as v goes up, then that means the size of the force needed to keep it in that moving in that circular path also increases. But it only increases up until a certain point. And this is effectively uh, the maximum frictional force that, that um, turntable can apply to the bottom of the mass. And there's going to be a point when it's moving so quickly that the mass just starts to slide off it. Um, and uh, yeah, the maximal frictional force uh, can be found because here, the gradient of this line, because again, the gradient is equal to v squared over r, the gradient is 18.74, and that means the size of the force is going to be equal to the gradient multiplied by the mass, which in this case was equal to uh, 50 grams. So we work out the gradient, we multiply it by the mass, and that gives us the maximum force, which in this case is 0 0.5. 9.4 newtons. And when that force is exceeded, uh, the mass will then just slide off the table. Uh, a little bit involved, but hopefully um, it's maybe a start to looking at that. And again, if you haven't done this in school yet, you might be doing something similar, and you can always come back and look at these questions at any time. On the 8th, we start again with the gravitational constant, permittivity of free space, and now the Boltzmann constant, uh, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. We then have our angular speed, uh, sometimes also called angular velocity. Um, and rather than this being the speed measured in meters per second, it's how much an angle changes um, with respect to time. Now, the angular speed 
can be calculated by the angle that something moves through every second. But yesterday, when it took 4.05 seconds to make 10 complete rotations, we've got 10 rotations, each of which is 2 pi radians, and we're going to divide that by the time it took, which is 4.05. And that meant here, yesterday, the angular velocity was equal to 15.5 radians per second. So that's the number of radians that that turntable was going through every single second. Well, the next one um, is about the International Space Station and the fact that astronauts appear to be weightless. So this is uh, the International Space Station. Uh, maybe it's a bit too big to actually fit within the video. Now, this is orbiting about 400 kilometres above the Earth's surface, which, when you sort of think about it, that's pretty much just scraping the Earth's atmosphere. And therefore, the size of the gravitational field strength is going to be approximately equal to the size on Earth. In fact, when we work it out, uh, using this formula here that we saw the other day, uh, we know the mass of the Earth, we know the radius, um, of the Earth, and we add that to the altitude of 400 kilometers, and this gives a value of 8.69 newtons per kilogram. So that's going to be the size of the gravitational field strength, which is pretty similar to 9.81 newtons per kilogram that we have on the surface of the Earth. So the International Space Station, uh, the astronauts on board, they're still experiencing gravity. However, they appear to be weightless, because um, the, the International Space Station is effectively falling at the same rate as everything else inside it, but it just happens to be that the Earth's surface is falling away at the same rate. So even though it's kind of falling towards the Earth, it never quite gets there. Um, and so they appear to be weightless because they, they're all falling at the same time, but they still have weight. The astronauts will still have a weight. The International Space Station still has a weight. It's just relative to one another. They're both falling at the same rate. On the 9th, we're going to convert uh, between RPM, uh, which is revolutions per minute, into radians per second. So this is very much the angular velocity of something. Now, 60 revolutions per minute, uh, we can think of that as maybe um, one revolution per second. And that means in one second, it goes through 2 pi radians, so 6.28 radians per second. But this is the kind of conversion factor. We multiply by 2 pi to go from a rotation to an angle in radians, and then to go from minutes to seconds, we divide by 60. So these are the numbers that I came up with. We then have something looking at the angular speed of a car driving round about a roundabout. Um, at 30 miles per hour. So the first thing we're going to do is convert from miles per hour into meters per second. So we're going to look at the maybe uh, multiplying it by 1609 to look at the number of meters per hour, divide by the time in one hour to get 13.4083 meters per second. And then using this equation here, um, which you might find in your data sheet, the angular speed is equal to the tangential velocity so the speed of something on there the, uh, that's actually moving in that circular path divided by the radius. Uh, so it's going to be this number here divided by 11, which is 1.2 radians per second. Now, here we have meters per second divided by meters, and that means the units are going to be second to the minus one. And effectively, a radian is kind of unitless. Uh, and that's because if you think about what we do to actually define the radian, we're looking at maybe the arc length divided by the radius. So we've got a distance divided by a distance. And really, a radian is something that's kind of unitless. OK, uh, we then have uh, some field lines around a point charge. Very similar to the question on gravitational field lines around uh, something with mass. We've got a positive charge and a negative charge. Now, effectively, if you were to imagine putting a positive charge in this field, it would be repelled by this positive charge and it would move away from it. If you put a positive charge here, it would be attracted to that and it would move towards it. So the arrows show the direction that a positive charge would move in that field. And that's why these ones are pointing away, these are pointing to it. But in both cases, we've drawn lines with the ruler, we've put some arrows on, 
the lines are normal to the surface, so they're pointing towards the very centre. And again, there's eight lines around each. On the 10th, um, we're going to convert from radians per second to the frequency in RPM. So we're doing kind of the opposite of yesterday. So now we're going to multiply by 60, divide by 2 pi. Uh, so if it's going at 60 radians per second, we multiply by 60, divide by 2 pi, and that's going to be 573 revolutions per minute. And again, we've uh, done the same thing each time, uh, converting uh, like that. Uh, the last two, I suppose really that's two significant figures, that's two significant figures, but both of these are to three significant figures, so I've displayed it in standard form to show that we've got two significant figures for those numbers there. For number two, um, the first bit is really about the relationship between time period and frequency. So the time period is equal to one over the frequency, or the frequency is equal to one divided by the time period, and you'll have done many calculations like this when you've looked at waves previously. We then want to know the time it takes to complete one full rotation. So here, um, the angular speed or the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi over uh, the time period, or the time period is equal to 2 pi over the angular frequency. So that's 2 pi divided by 0 0.71, giving an answer of 8.8. .8. Point eight seconds. So that's how long it takes to do one full uh, rotation. Uh, and the frequency is just going to be 1 over its time period, which is this number up here. Um, and again, I haven't rounded it down, I've just used the raw format here to get an answer of 0 0.11 hertz. Number three is about Coulomb's law, uh, which is similar to Newton's law of gravitation, but now we're looking at charged objects. Uh, and Coulomb's law really talks about how the force is going to be proportional uh, to the charges multiplied by each other uh, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And here's the equation. Uh, so the force is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q1 Q2 over R squared. Uh, sometimes, again, you might uh, see maybe small q and large q uh, to represent the charges. Um, in actual fact, in A-level physics, sometimes we use E to maybe represent the charge on an electron. We might use Q or we might use large Q. All of these can be used to, to represent the charge in an object. Um, and here, epsilon naught, so is uh, this is like a Greek letter epsilon, and that represents the permittivity of free space. And then the last part here really explains what it means. Um, and uh, effectively, we assume that... Um, the permittivity of free space, the permittivity of a vacuum, is approximately the same as the permittivity of air, which is where most of our things actually take place. Again, the full description of that is in the back of the book. On the 11th, um, again, we want to look at the angular speed of an object. Uh, we've got a frequency of 50 hertz. So that means it goes around 50 times a second. And here, the angular speed is equal to 2 pi f. Again, you might notice that this is something that you've seen in lessons or maybe in your data sheet. So it's just 2 pi times f, so it's 100 pi, so that's 3.1 times 10 to the 2 radians per second um, to two significant figures, like that raw data. The other one over here, um, to convert uh, into radians per second from revolutions per minute, we've multiplied by 2 pi to convert the revolutions into the total angle in radians divided by the time of one minute, giving uh, here an answer of 5.2 radians per second. The next question uh, is based on one that I saw on Isaac Physics. I thought that this was a lovely question because it kind of uh, looked at um, series and parallel circuits and also what happens if you have uh, cells which are connected in parallel. Now, effectively, I've redrawn this whole circuit over here. And because we've got three parallel uh, cells, their total EMF is still going to be equal to 1.5 volts. We then effectively have three resistors in parallel going to one resistor in series, which is what we have over here. So the total potential difference is 1.5 volts. If you've got three of these in parallel, their total res combined resistance is going to be equal to 10 over 3, and we're going to add that to the 10 that we have here to get 13.33 ohms, 
The current is therefore V over R, which is 0 0.1125 or 0 0.11 amps. Deceptively, deceptively simple when you know how, but it is a challenging question. Um, effectively, if you've got cells which are in series, we'd add up the total PDs. So if they had a, um, an EMF or a potential difference of 1.5 across each, if they're in series, that would be 3.0 volts. But if they were connected like this, um, then their total uh, potential difference or EMF across this would be 1.5 volts when they're in parallel. Okay, uh, using Coulomb's law uh, that we saw on the last page, um, if you've got two positive charges, the force is going to be equal to a positive number times a positive number which is positive, and therefore that's going to be um, repelling. If you've got two negative charges, a negative times a negative is a positive, and two negative charges repel. If you've got two opposite charges, then a negative times a plus is going to be a negative, and therefore these things attract. And so the symbol tells you if it's an attractive or repulsive force, and gravity is always attractive, and therefore you should have a negative sign in front of it. Uh, so Newton's law should be F equals minus G M M over R squared. Again, doesn't matter which M's you use, if they're capital or lowercase, or they're, they've got a 1 and 2 in front of them. But the negative symbol here shows that gravity is always an attractive force. OK, differentiation, I think, could be quite important. And if you're watching this, then there's a good chance you might be doing A-level maths as well. Now, if y is equal to x, then dy by dx is just equal to 1. If it's um, x squared, then effectively we bring the 2 down in front of it to make it 2x. And if you've got x cubed, we bring the 3 down here, take that power down by 1 down to x squared. So dy by dx is equal to 3x squared. Now, if you don't understand this, if you're not doing A-level maths, don't worry about it. But the reason I'm doing this is I think it could be important to help you understand a little bit more about simple harmonic motion. So I've started simple. There are answers, obviously, in the back of the book. Uh, but that's um, how we differ differentiate those three things. Hopefully that's OK. We then have uh, an aircraft. It takes 49 seconds to travel in a circle of radius 80 metres. The frequency um, is going to be 1 over the time period. So 1 over 49, so 0 0.02 zero hertz. The angular speed, omega, is 2 pi f. So f is uh, what we calculated up here. So that's equal to 0 0.13 radians per second. But its linear speed, v, um, or its tangential speed, is equal to r omega, so 80 times the, the answer we got from up here, which is 10 meters per second. We then have a question uh, using Newton, using Coulomb's law of attraction. Um, and we're going to look at the force between a proton and an electron. So um, we've got 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And here I've put minus E and plus E because that's going to be minus the elementary charge times the elementary charge. So on the electron and the proton divided by the distance between them. Um, e times E is effectively E squared. And this gives us a total force of 2.3 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons, and there's a negative symbol in front of it which shows it's attractive. However, if we had the same proton and electron, the same distance apart, we could have a look at the size of the gravitational force between them, so gm1 m2 over r squared, got the gravitational constant, mass of a proton, mass of an electron, distance between them, and this gives us a value of minus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 45 newtons. Still negative, still attractive, but now it's significantly smaller. And if we want to look at the ratio between these two numbers, it's just this number divided by that number, and a small number divided by a really, really small number gives us a really big number. So 2.3 times 10 to the 39. And effectively what we're saying here is that the gravitational force between these objects is so much smaller than the electrostatic force and that's why at this small scale, it's often the electrostatic force that we consider. We kind of tend to ignore the effects of gravity on the small scale. It's only when we go to big things like stars and planets that the force of gravity really is the thing that we need to consider.
Um, so yeah, just a little bit about forces, which I'm sure you will cover again. We then have a practical example. Here we've got a couple of retort stands. We've got a spring on each one connected to either side of a trolley. And at the moment it's in equilibrium in the central position. But if we pull it to this side, what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be a resultant force on it which is acting to the left. And so initially this would accelerate to the left. But as the displacement from that central point decreases, the acceleration is going to have a lower value. The acceleration decreases because this spring isn't going to be pulling as much. But once it goes to the left of its initial position, now that spring is going to be pulling on it and it's going to be acting to the right, so it's going to start to accelerate to the right. So what we find is when we have a positive displacement, we have a negative acceleration, and the size of that acceleration is also going to be proportional or related to the size of that displacement from its equilibrium position. For the second part of the 13th, um, when the trolley is pulled to its maximum position, the energy is going to be stored in the elastic potential energy store. Uh, one equation you could use is a half k delta L squared. Uh, sometimes we use an x or an e for the extension. But when it's got the maximum kinetic energy, that's when it's going to be traveling quickest, which is actually at a displacement of zero. So although it might be pulled up to one side, once it's released, it's going to accelerate towards the center, get quicker and quicker, and then it's going to start to decelerate or accelerate in the opposite direction, and it starts to slow down again. So it's always moving quickest in the very middle, and that's where it's going to have the highest kinetic energy. And we can see that on the graph down here. So we've got displacement on the x-axis and energy on the y-axis. The total energy is going to remain constant throughout because we're going to assume that no energy is lost to the surroundings. Now, at uh, so this, this black line here is the kinetic energy. And when the displacement is zero, it's got the maximum kinetic energy, which then decreases as it gets further away from the center. But that energy is going to be transferred to the elastic potential energy in the springs. And what we can see here is actually this curve is the same shape as this one because whatever value is on um, in terms of the elastic potential energy, we can add that value to this value and it will always equal this value here. So for example, uh, here the elastic potential energy might be 2, uh, the kinetic energy is 6 and they add up to make 8. So the blue line and the black line will always add together to give a constant value which in this case is the total energy of this ideal oscillating system. So on the 14th, we start with some differentiation again. And again, you might need to look this up or just check maybe uh, with some of your notes from A-level maths. If you differentiate sine, you get cos. If you differentiate cos, you get minus sine. If you differentiate minus sine, you get minus cos. And if you just differentiate minus cos, you go back to sine. Okay, again, that can be important. Uh, we then have a question about centripetal acceleration. Um, now here the acceleration is equal to v squared over r. So if we know how quickly it's going and the radius, we can work out its centripetal acceleration. In this case it's a equals v squared over r, which is 49 meters per second squared. If something has an angular speed of 0.95 radians per second, we can use this equation over here. Again, this might be given to you in your data book. A is equal to r omega squared. So both of these equations here can be used to work out the size of that centripetal acceleration. We're going to feed some numbers in, and this tells us here the acceleration is 0 0.63 meters per second squared. We then have um, just a thing of drawing a sinusoidal curve. So this could be a, a cos, uh, a sine, minus sine, minus cos. It's that kind of shape. Uh, so all I needed you to do uh, was sort of finish the lines. And this is kind of what you'll see. Uh, so that's just a skill that you can develop. I would recommend if you're going to be drawing these lines, um, keep your hand on the inside of the curve, and that means you might need to move the paper as you go around each time. So that's an important skill that I know you can get uh, by doing the work in this book. On the 15th, uh, again, there's a bit more differentiation. It gets a little bit more tricky here, but effectively this letter in front is just a kind of constant in front of that. So if you're differentiating cos x, you get minus sine x, but the a in front doesn't change. 
especially if you're differentiating with respect to x. If you differentiate sine, we get cos, and that's just going to be equal to a cos x. But if you've got bx, effectively we might think of this as sine of bx, then the bx doesn't change. So you still have, going from sine to cos, we'd have cos bx, but we also then add that constant in front to make it b cos bx. That is not explained anywhere near as well as a math teacher could, but hopefully you're going to start to see a pattern emerge. We then have something about simple harmonic motion, uh, and effectively we can say that the acceleration is proportional to the displacement, but in the opposite direction. Again, that would be uh, carried out multiple times. This is a definition you just need to know. And again, in the back of the book, there's the kind of the full written thing that you just need to learn, and also some examples from everyday life. We then have a couple of um, things here. We've got y equals sine x, which looks like this, so it starts at zero. And we've got y equals cos x, which starts at kind of plus one. And this is what we'd see on the graph. And again, this is just building on the skill that you started yesterday, where you just kind of uh, actually drew in a sinusoidal curve. Now we're starting to identify which curve is which, or just remind you about what you currently know about them. We have some more differentiation on the 16th of September. Um, so we differentiate sine to cos. The bx uh, kind of stays the same. And now the b uh, comes to the front, and we multiply it by a. So we've got a b cos bx. You'd have a b sine bx, but it's going to be minus sine. And here, because we're going to differentiate um, minus sine, that becomes minus cos. Uh, and then we've got a bx here, and the b comes in front to make ab cos bx. Okay. We then have um, the same trolley, oscillation from side to side like we saw before. Sketch a displacement time graph for the trolley from the moment it is released in the position above. Now, if it's released here, at time equals zero, x has a certain quantity. Um, let's call it a. Okay. And that means at time equals zero we've got a certain value here that it starts at. It's going to decrease as it goes towards the central position, and then it's going to increase in the negative direction. And what we get is a sinusoidal curve. But this one here is in the form of y is equal to cos x, um, because we're starting not at the origin, but at a certain value, which is equal to the amplitude of that. We then have a question about plotting the corresponding velocity time graph. So here we've got a, a displacement time graph and we're going to basically look at what the corresponding velocity time graph looks like. Now to do that, in the first section we just need to think about what the gradient is equal to. So here it goes 10 in one second. So initially its velocity is 10 metres per second. Between one and three seconds it goes another 10 metres, but if it goes 10 metres in two seconds, it goes five metres in one second, so its velocity is five, and then zero. And effectively, we have a kind of like sine shape here, and now we've got more of a cos shape if we look at that data. On the 17th, again, more differentiation, uh, but now we're gonna differentiate with respect to t. So here we've got x, and what we want to look at is dx by dt, the rate of change of displacement, which is also equal to velocity. And here, that's going to be equal to minus ab sine bt. It's, it's no different. I mean, most of the time in maths, you tend to use x's and y's, but we often look at how something changes with respect to time in physics. So ab sine bt is the answer. Uh, if you had the velocity and we want to differentiate with respect to time, effectively, we're looking at the rate of change of velocity, which is also what we call acceleration. And here that's equal to AB uh, times minus cos BT. Okay, we've now got a spring, which is hanging vertically. Um, and when it's resting in its equilib equilibrium position, there's going to be a weight force acting down, and that's going to be equal in size and opposite in direction to the tension force provided by that spring. And the things that determine how much it extends include the spring constant k 
and the mass of that spring, because effectively, if you've got a bigger mass, there's going to be a, be a bigger weight, which is pulling it down. Uh, and the extension also depends upon the spring constant. You know, that's the extension per unit um, force. OK, uh, then the mass is pulled down through a displacement x and release it oscillates up and down. Sketch the shape of a displacement time graph for the mass from the time it first passes its equilibrium position. So effectively, as it passes the equilibrium position, x is going to be equal to zero when time is zero. And that means what we have here is a shape which looks like y is equal to sine x. So this is a sine curve. It's going to go up at some point to the, the maximum value, the, the amplitude of its um, oscillations. But here we've got a displacement time graph that starts at the equilibrium position rather than, uh, I think, yesterday, where we started uh, the time when it was at its maximum displacement. OK, so a couple of uh, sinusoidally shaped displacement time graphs there. Uh, we're now going to sketch the shape of the corresponding velocity time graph to this displacement time graph. So effectively, this is xt and this is vt. And what we want to look at is the gradient. Now here, we've got the steepest gradient at time zero, and that means the velocity would be its highest value. And as time goes on, we get to a point where the gradient is zero as it's changing direction, and that means its velocity is going to be zero at that point. So at two seconds, that's the maximum value. And here, that's equal to zero. We then have a maximum negative gradient, so our most negative value. We then have the gradient equal to zero, so that's equal to zero. And effectively, what we've got here is we've gone from a shape which is y equals sine x, and we've gone to a shape where y is equal to cos x. OK, so we've gone from a sine to a cos-shaped curve. And effectively, what we've done is we said, well, x is equal to, say, sine t. That means dx by dt is equal to cos t. And that's because on here, dx by dt is the same as its velocity. So what we've gone from is x equals sine t to v equals cos t. OK, hopefully that's making sense a little bit. I'm sure it will a little bit more in a second. On the 18th, uh, we're going to differentiate all of these with respect to time. Uh, so dx by dt is going to be minus omega a sine omega t, which is actually this equation down here. And that's going to be equal to the velocity. And if we were to differentiate the velocity with respect to time, we would get the acceleration, which is now going to be minus omega squared a cos omega t. Because the omega t uh, effectively stays the same. We're going to multiply this by omega, the constant, and it's going to become a cos. Um, that might be uh, relevant for some st more stuff we're going to be doing about simple harmonic motion. We then have a pendulum. Now, when it's e in its equilibrium position, where it's just hanging down, the tension uh, caused by the string upwards is going to be equal in size and opposite in direction to the weight of the bob at the bottom of that string. But when it's pulled to the side, there's going to be the vector sum of the gravitational force down, its weight, and the tension in the string. And that's going to cause a resultant force which is directed back towards the equilibrium position. And if we're to sketch the shape of the velocity time graph, when it's released from here, it's going to start to speed up. So its velocity is going to increase until it gets to the equilibrium position. And then as it moves in the other direction, it's going to slow down till it gets to um, zero again. And then it's going to move back in the other direction. So now we have a negative velocity, gets to its maximum negative value uh, at the equilibrium position, and then it's going to slow down to zero. So what we effectively have there is a y equals sine x shape, or a sine graph here, as the velocity um, goes from zero up, down, up, down, up, down, backwards and forwards with this simple harmonic motion. Question three, we've got um, this graph here. So this is a displacement time graph. Um, and it's in the form of x is equal to sine t, something like that. Now, to work out the shape of the velocity time graph, then uh, dx by dt is equal to v. 
which in this case is equal to cos t. So we've gone from a sine graph to a cos graph. Effectively, um, if we look at the gradient here, when the gradient is zero, this value of this graph is going to be zero. We've got the maximum negative gradient, maximum negative value. We've got a gradient of zero and zero here. Maximum positive displacement, maximum value on this graph. Now to go from this one to the next one, effectively what we're doing is dv by dt, which is going to be the acceleration, which in this case is going to be minus sine t. Okay, so now, um, again, if we think about what this is, we've got the gradient here is going to be the value. So we've got zero gradient, zero acceleration, maximum negative gradient, maximum negative value, and so on. And what you might see here is that this is, because this is a minus sine graph and that's a sine graph, we can see how the acceleration is going to be proportional to the displacement, but the negative value of it. And this is why this is a graph, or this is one reason that this is a graph of something undergoing simple harmonic motion. Again, if you've not done this in school, this might be quite a leap from where you are. If you've done this in school, hopefully this is just reaffirming uh, the things that your teachers have actually done with you in lessons. On the 19th, um, we've got some questions about more of the experimental setup for looking at a pendulum. Uh, the first one is how could an accurate measurement um, of L be taken? So the length of the pendulum is from the center of the mass or the center of the bob to this point up here where that string uh, actually meets the clamp. And sometimes what we do is we get a couple of blocks of wood uh, and that gives us a definite point where that string goes to. Um, you could do this when it's hanging up, you could even put it on the table maybe, but you want to get that ruler as close to it as possible, uh, keep your eye level so there's no parallax error, and, and other things it says in the back of the book. The bob is then displaced 30 millimetres to the left and released. How could you reliably repeat it? Well, what you might have is maybe another block of wood that's maybe a clamped in position. Um, if you did that, then that means as soon as you bring it back to touch it, you know that you're going to be exactly in the right position every single time, rather than just holding it there and guessing. Now, if the pendulum was released from an initial amplitude of 10 rather than 30, there shouldn't be any effect on the time period. And the reason for that is that the time period, it doesn't really relate to the initial displacement. Now, if you had a smaller initial displacement, we'd have a smaller acceleration and a smaller velocity, but it wouldn't be going as far, so the time taken would be the same. Uh, so this one over here, I mean, you still want to make sure you're repeating everything as closely as you can in the experiment, so everything is done in exactly the same way for each measurement that you take. But with a pendulum, the oscillation doesn't really depend on the amplitude, the, the time period is going to be independent of the amplitude. And as it goes from side to side, there's going to be this transfer between the kinetic energy store and the gravitational potential energy store. And over time, uh, some of the energy is also going to be transferred to the thermal store of the surroundings. And that's why um, eventually it stops moving completely. We then have a question about percentage uncertainties. I haven't forgotten about these. If you're not sure, look in book two and book three. Uh, but we've got our time. I've guessed that approximately human reaction time is maybe 0 0.2 of a second. So we've got our uncertainty over the measured value times 100 is about 2% in the timing error. And that's why uh, we want to record the time for 10 oscillations, not just one, because if we had that time for one oscillation, it would give us more like a 20% error. We then have the velocity time graph. So it goes up and down and up and down. We want to look at the shape of the corresponding kinetic energy time graph. So this is not a normal graph that we normally use, but effectively kinetic energy is always going to have a positive value, so we ignore anything down here. And we know that kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Um, whatever the value here is, which is 0 0.15, we can square that and times it by half the mass. And therefore we know that roughly the peaks are going to be at about 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4 joules. Uh, and what we have here is a shape uh, like a y equals sine x squared uh, graph. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's got two peaks for like one cycle. 
uh, because whatever it is here is going to be the same again here, which we can see here. A little bit more advanced, um, but hopefully that makes sense. Okay, on the 20th, um, another question about percentage uncertainty. Um, we've got repeated values, so we need to look at the mean value and also half the range. And here, the percentage uncertainty over these repeated values is half the range divided by the mean times 100 is 10%. Um, and that means the result that should be recorded would be the mean value, uh, 9.7, plus or minus 10%. We then have a question about the volume of uh, an atomic nuclei, or the volume of a sphere. So the first bit is what's the relationship between the mass and the nucleon number. So effectively the mass is proportional to the nucleon number. If you were to have double the number of nucleons, double the number of protons and neutrons, we would double the mass. Then what's the link between the nuclear radius r and the mass? Well, the volume is going to be equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. And we know that the mass is going to be proportional to the volume. And that means the mass is going to be proportional to r cubed. Or, I suppose, writing this another way where r is a subject, the radius is going to be proportional to the mass to the power of a third. But, of course, we know that the mass is proportional to the nucleon number. And that means we could also say that the radius is proportional to the nucleon number to the power of a third. And then to finish off the 20th, some more definitions, all of which you can find in the back of the book and then make your own key cards out of and then start learning them. Right, the 21st. Uh, the first question is about a micrometer. Um, we've got the absolute uncertainty. We've got... Uh, the value of 0 0.42. So uh, the percentage uncertainty um, is equal to the uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty divided by the measured value times 100, which is 2.4%. And then there's also uh, a bit about how a more accurate value could be recorded. Well, instead, you don't just want to measure in one position, you want to measure at several positions around the wire, so you know that it's actually uh, circular in kind of cross-section. And if you take repeated readings, uh, we can then look at um, half the range divided by the mean value, which hopefully should give you a, a truer value of what the, the radius or the, the diameter actually is. Okay, the next bit here says that r is equal to r naught a to a third. Now remember, yesterday we said that the radius of that nucleus is going to be proportional to the nucleon number to the power of a third. Here, r naught is going to be our constant of proportionality. The first bit, because we're looking at really, really tiny things, is fm, where we've got a femtometer. So what does f mean? Well, it just means uh, one of these constants. And again, like all of the stuff in the book, um, I haven't written everything in here, but we can see that on the 21st, um, femto is 10 to the minus 15 r naught is the radius of a single uh, nucleon. So effectively r naught represents maybe the radius of a proton or a neutron. And if we know that, we can then use that to calculate the radius of a carbon-12 nucleus. So we've written down the equation. We've got 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15, because it's femto, times 12, the total number of nucleons in carbon-12 to the third, which is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 15 metres, which is really, really small. For number three, I've now got a question about electric field lines. These are between two parallel plates, and there's a PD across them. Now, effectively, in between the plates, we're going to have this uniform field, so we've got these equally spread out field lines. Towards the end, they'd actually kind of bend out around a little bit like this. And if we were to think about what would happen if you put a positive charge in this field, that's going to be repelled from the positive, attracted towards the negative, and therefore the field lines are going to point from positive to negative. OK, 22nd. Uh, again, another question about percentage uncertainties. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the calculated value of resistivity. Now, there isn't much space here, so you can always use a bit of extra paper um, to kind of answer these things. Now, the resistivity is Ra over L. 
and the area is going to be equal to pi d squared over 4. So to work out the resistivity, you multiply the radius, uh, sorry, the resistance by the diameter squared divided by the length, and of course pi and 4 are just constants. So the percentage uncertainty in this is going to be equal to the percentage uncertainty in resistance plus 2 times uh, the percentage uncertainty in the diameter plus the uncertainty in the length, which when you just add all of these up as like an estimation, gives an answer of 10.9%, which I guess you could also probably legitimately write as 11% to maybe two significant figures. Um, but again, this is just an estimation. So is it really 10.9? Is it 11? I'm sure you could argue either way. We then have some oxygen 16. We're going to calculate its radius using that equation. Uh, so it's just R naught times A to the third, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 15 metres. Its volume is going to be 4 thirds pi R cubed. Um, and again, this is the radius here, so it's, I suppose, really big R, which is cubed. Um, and that's equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 43 cubic metres. Pretty, pretty small. The mass is going to be equal to the number of nucleons times the atomic mass unit. So 16 times 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. Uh, the atomic mass unit will be given to you in your uh, data book. And that's 2.7 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. And then density is just mass divided by volume. Uh, which is going to be equal to 2.3 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic metre, which is an immensely large number, but this is because we're looking at the density of a nucleus. You know, it's these tightly packed protons and neutrons. Okay, uh, a couple more questions looking at the electric field. We've got a point charge. Uh, this is negative, so the field lines are going to go towards it. When we've got a charged sphere, uh, this one's positive, so the field lines are pointing away. And effectively, these field lines kind of point towards the centre, but they finish at the surface, and they're going to be normal to that surface. Okay, and again, I've just drawn eight field lines with a ruler for both of those. On the 23rd, we have yet another question to do with uncertainties. Uh, we want to calculate its resistance. So R is just V over I, which is 5 ohms, all straightforward so far. Now, to work out the uncertainty in this, uh, we need to look at the total uh, combined uncertainty, which is going to be equal to this plus this, which is 15%. And then we're going to work out 15% of 5.0, which is 0 0.75. So here, um, the answer is 5.0 ohms, and the uncertainty is 0 0.75 ohms. We have a question about uranium-235. Again, just like yesterday, we're going to use this equation here to work out its radius, uh, which is 7.4 times 10 to the minus 15. We're going to cube that, times it by 4 thirds pi, to get 1.7 times 10 to the minus 42. There are 235 nucleons. They all have, on average, the atomic mass unit of 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. And then, when we work out its density, the density is 2.3 times 10 to the 17, which was the same answer as yesterday. We then have a rough sketch of the electric field between these shapes. Now, excuse my lines, it's just a sketch, but effectively they're going to go from positive to negative. Okay, and at any point, if you think about, if you were to put maybe a, a positive charge here, which way would it go? Well, it's going to be repelled away from this and towards this. So it kind of, again, these lines are all kind of normal to the surface, pretty much. Uh, and they're all going from the positive to the negative, where they all meet it uh, normal to that surface. At least that's what I've tried to do for that. So on the 24th, we want to calculate the electrical power, which is just Vi, so that's 0 0.66 watts. That's easy. Uh, to work out its uncertainty, we need to look at the percentage uncertainty in both of these values. So we've got the uncertainty, divide by the value, multiply by 100, has these as our percentage uncertainties. I've added them together to look at the total or combined uncertainty of 7.88%. And then we've worked out 7.88% of 0 0.66, which is equal to 0 0.052. Uh, so to two significant figures, 0 0.66 watts plus or minus 0 0.052 watts. Hopefully that's okay. 
We then needed to state the density, so you don't actually need to calculate. Um, or you could calculate them if you wanted to. But what we'd find is that all of these have the same value of 2.3 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic metre. And this just really shows that by using the equation that says r is equal to r naught a to a third, and sometimes, again, uh, the constant here could be given as r naught with a little r rather than a capital, um, all uh, nuclei have the same density, uh, and that's why, um, effectively, if you've got something which is bigger, it's going to be heavier, but all of these things have the same density. And then we've got, again, my kind of rough sketch down here, the electric field between a positive plate and a negative sphere. So if the plate is positive and the sphere is negative, the field lines are going to go from positive to negative, all leaving uh, normal to the surface and then coming in normal to the surface approximately down here like that. OK, hopefully that's all right. It's really difficult to do those sketches neatly, isn't it? Um, something in the book that it does recommend, and I do genuinely think that this book could be really useful for you, is this book by Isaac Physics. This is not paid promotion. But I just genuinely think it's something that could be really useful. And it's the kind of thing that if you're thinking about doing physics at university, you should definitely be doing. Or if you love maths or engineering, it's worth having a look at some of these questions. It does get pretty difficult, but in the back, there are also some of these answers. So it actually gives you the answers to some of the questions, which is something that Isaac Physics don't normally do. So if you are thinking about uh, how you can get the top grades and how you really extend yourself, have a look at the linking concepts in pre-university physics book by Isaac Physics. Right, talking of Isaac Physics, I saw a question similar to this when I went to a conference over in Cambridge, uh, and it's really about this kind of thing here. So effectively, you've got a gear that turns another gear that turns another one and another one and another one. And you'll notice here, as I'm turning the one at the end, if I just hold that as steady as I can, everything's working, but the one on the right-hand side is hardly turning at all. Okay, so we've got the outer part is, um, I think, 24, and the inner one is 8. And when this goes through one complete rotation, the one next to it goes by a third, and that goes to a third of that, which is a ninth. A third of that, again, would be a 27th, an 81th, and a 243th. Okay, so when cog zero goes through one rotation, the number of rotations of cog one would be 0 0.33. And if we were to take the natural log of that, that would be minus 1.1. And we can complete the table and we find that we have these values. We then plot the data on the graph below. And as we have the number increasing, the natural log of r decreases. And we get this straight line here, where the gradient has a value of minus 1.1. Don't forget, it's a negative gradient, so you've got to have a negative number in front of it. What is the significance of this? And why is this seen when a graph of the natural log is plotted? Because effectively what we have is like an exponential decay function if we were to look at the rotation of these cogs. Now the other thing you might find is if you calculate e to the minus a gradient, that's going to be the same as um, e to the 1.1, which is 3.0, which is also the ratio of the number of teeth on the large to the smaller cog. Okay, and Again, that might be have some significance when it comes on to stuff later on. Now, there's also a question. That if you had this going 100 times along, so you had 100 of these rather than just six, how many rotations would cog number 99 have to make to, co to cause number zero to rotate by one? So we've got 100 things in total. Um, and effectively, if we look at the numbers over here, cog number one is one over three to the 1, 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 3 cubed, 1 over 3 to the 4, 1 over 3 to the 5, and so on. So number 99, if cog 0 made one turn, would make 1 over 3 to the 99th rotations. Uh, and then if we take the reciprocal of that, this cog at the end would have to rotate 1.7 times 10 to the 47 times in order for this one over here to rotate one time. So... Um, 
quite amazing. Um, I think it's amazing. It's a lovely little question uh, shown in Lego. And this is based again on like an Isaac physics question that was maybe a little bit simpler than this. But this is an example of something where we have an exponential decay function. And we can actually attach or show that there's a formula that we can use with this. And then we can then link that to plotting some data. And that's what we're going to be doing a lot more over the month. OK, um, we now have an equation for the centripetal acceleration, a equals v squared over r. And the velocity, uh, tangential velocity, can be calculated using v equals omega r. Square both sides of this one, where we've got v squared equals omega squared r squared. We can put this back into that equation over here. And then we get a is equal to omega squared r squared over r. These cancel to make a is equal to omega squared r. Or sometimes we write this as a is equal to r omega squared. So here we've got an equation with the tangential velocity or its speed. And here we've got one with its angular velocity. Right, the next one. Velocity is going to be the rate of change of displacement. We differentiate this, so dx by dt is going to be v, which is minus omega a sine omega t. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. And if we differentiate this answer here with respect to t, that's either dx, that's either the double differentiation of x or it's dv by dt, so it's the acceleration, which is minus omega squared a cos omega t. And if we compare this to this, we can see that we've got a cos omega t and we've got a cos omega t as well. And really what this is saying is that the acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x or the acceleration is proportional to the displacement and in the opposite direction. And therefore, this is a defining equation for simple harmonic motion. So here, we've looked at x having a certain value at time t equals zero, differentiated it twice, and that shows that we've got something undergoing SHM. On the 27th, um, we've got this equation here for something moving in a circular path. The velocity is 2 pi r over t, so the speed equals the distance of one orbit divided by the time period of one orbit. If we square both sides, we get uh, 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. And if we equate that to this, we can say that gm over r is equal to 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. Um, and if we re re rearrange to make t the subject, effectively we bring t up here. That r multiplies by r squared to become r cubed. And then we've got 4 pi squared divided by gm. And here we can see that actually t squared is proportional to r cubed. If you've got big G, which is a constant, pi, which is a constant, 4 is a constant, and the mass of that uh, body is going to be constant as well. And therefore, things orbiting around it, their time period squared, is going to be proportional to the distance away from that object cubed. Now, simple harmonic motion for number 27. Uh, we've already done this, but effectively, a is proportional to minus x. If we differentiate this with respect to time, dx by dt is the velocity, which is omega a cos omega t. Differentiate this again, so dv by dt is the acceleration, which is now minus omega squared a sine omega t. Compare your answer for this to this, and here we've got x is a sine omega t, and we've got an a sine omega t here as well. And therefore, the acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x, or a is proportional to minus x. So again, starting with x in terms of sine t rather than cos t like yesterday, we can still differentiate twice and show that this is another equation that can be used for the displacement of something, and it's the displacement of something that changes with time, and therefore it's simple harmonic motion. On the 28th, a uh, bit a bit cheeky, we've got some kinetic energy, potential energy, and this is really about if you maybe had a charged particle moving towards a nucleus, uh, how far away would it stop before it's like um, reflected? So if we equate the two, then when the kinetic energy, half mv squared, 
is equal to qq over 4 pi epsilon naught r. We can see that we've got a half, so that's 1 over 2, and that's 1 over 4, so that's the same as 1 over 2. So mv squared equals qq over 2 pi epsilon naught r. And if we want to rearrange to make r the subject, we just bring r up here, and we bring this down here, and therefore r is equal to qq over 2 pi epsilon naught mv squared. And this is sometimes known as the closest approach estimate. It's a way that we can maybe start to estimate the size of the nuclear um, radius or how big the central part of the atom actually is. Uh, for number two, we've got a displacement time graph for an object undergoing several harmonic motion. The amplitude is five centimetres, so the maximum position, both positive and negative, is going to be either plus five or minus five centimetres. The time period is 1.2 seconds. Uh, so effectively I've marked on 1.2 here, so that's going to be 0 0.6 over there. Um, and if the displacement can be described with the equation x equals a sine omega t, this is going to be a sine graph where at time t equals 0, x equals 0. So that's why I've drawn it like that. Okay, what's next? The 29th, of course. Okay, so we've got um, the kinetic energy of a moving object is this, the gravitational potential energy between two masses. Uh, and now we're going to maybe look at an object which is trying to escape the gravitational field of something bigger. So we've equated a half mv squared to gmm over r. The small m's cancel uh, to say v squared over 2 is equal to gm over r. And to make v the subject, we've basically multiplied both sides by 2. And then we've just square rooted uh, to find that v is equal to 2gm over r. And that's the escape velocity. In actual fact, if you want to go a stage further, uh, we could rearrange this to actually, I suppose, say that um, r is equal to 2gm over v squared. Uh, and we can actually use this to maybe look at um, the radius of a black hole. Um, some interesting kind of stuff there. And then we've got another graph to plot. Uh, here we've been given the frequency. And if you know the frequency, we can work out the time period of one uh, cycle, which is 1.6 seconds. Um, so from here to here is going to be a time of 1.6 seconds. Um, but now x equals a cos omega t. So effectively, when time is zero, um, the displacement is going to be equal to the amplitude. Uh, and therefore, we start at the amplitude of 0 0.04 um, metres, so 40 millimetres, uh, which is what we had on here, so it's metres on the graph. Um, and then one oscillation takes 1.6 seconds. So again, uh, trying to relate uh, this equation, some data, to what it might look like visually. On the 30th, um, is this, I think is this, yeah, this is the last day of September, uh, we have a micrometer uh, used to measure the diameter of a large ball bearing. Uh, three readings are taken. Again, this is building on stuff that you should have seen in books two and three. So the first thing I did was just looked at the reading. Uh, so it's two point something. It's 2.5 and then it's plus uh, 0.29. So it's going to be 2.79, 2.84 and 2.73. The mean is just those added together divided by three, um, which is 2.79 millimetres. The absolute uncertainty is going to be half the range. So this number, take away that number, divided by 2. So the absolute uncertainty is 0 0.06 millimetres. The percentage uncertainty is half the range, divided by the mean value, times 100, so it's 2%. Now the volume is going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed, which is this really, really small number. And the percentage uncertainty in that volume because to work out the volume, you're either using r or d cubed. You're just going to have this number here multiplied by 3. Now, I used kind of this unrounded version here, which gave an answer of about 5.9. But again, you know, this is only a way of like estimating things, so a value of about 6% would be appropriate. But the uncertainty in the volume is then going to be equal to 6% or 5.9% of this value here, which is 5.4 times 10 to the minus 9 cubic metres. Hopefully that was okay. So there we go. Uh, that was September. 
Um, and now onwards and upwards on to October. <laughs>